says I have and I do what it tells me to do. And I love my Bible, so I make this as a confession that I will meditate therein both day and night on a chapter in the morning and a chapter in the evening. And because I do, my life is blessed. It's no more a mess. Now everything I touch, everything I touch now turns to success. If you believe that, shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Glory to God. Put your hands together for everybody joining us online at Facebook and YouTube. Welcome to our grand opening celebration. We're glad to have you a part. I believe I've got a special word from God for you. So let's go ahead and pray and we'll get right into it today in Jesus name. Bow your head with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this another opportunity to sit at your feet and receive your word. Father, your word is a lamp unto our feet. It's a light unto our path. We ask you to shine the light of your word to us today by the Holy Spirit. Help us to see it. Help us to get it. Your word to us in the name of Jesus. And let not one of us leave the same way that we came. Let us all be changed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, open with me in your Bible, if you would, to the book of Isaiah chapter 54. And then we also are going to look at Matthew chapter 9. And I'm concluding today a series that I started on January the 5th that's called Expansion. We find the text for the series, which essentially embodies God's message to us in these two passages. In Isaiah 54, if you want to notice on the screen, it says, to enlarge the place of your tent. God is telling the people of that day to enlarge where, they've, where they live. In other, in other words, get a bigger place. He said, let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. In other words, you know, stretch out where you live. Do not spare. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. So God is talking to the people of that day about expanding at, at whatever level. I mean, they were doing good, and now he said, now you're going to need to expand. Matter of fact, verse 3, he says it specifically, enlarge the place of your tent, for you shall expand to the right and to the left. And your descendants will inherit the nations and make the desolate cities inhabited. I believe with all of my heart that God is not just saying this to the children of Israel at that day. I prayed and I sought God as we came into another season of life. And I believe that God is saying to you, expansion. He sees the end from the beginning. He's saying, get ready because you are about to expand. Things about your life are about to expand to the right and expand to the left. At the end of this beautiful chapter in this prophetic word, in Isaiah 54, verse 17, we've also taken as a text that no weapon formed against you will prosper. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn and this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, says the Lord. You know, I wish I could stand here and tell you or prophesy to you that 2020 is going to be an amazing year and you're not going to have any more troubles. How many of you are glad 2019 is over? <laughs> hey, man, bye-bye, you know. Lord, let this be a better year. Well, I'm here to tell you today that I believe with all of my heart this will be one of the best years of your life. You say, well, Pastor Stan, you know, you don't even know me. But the Bible says that the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. I may not know you, but God ordered your steps to be here today, and he's giving you this message to say, get ready, because life is about to get bigger than it's been. Now, that doesn't mean that weapons won't form 
against you. It, won't, it doesn't mean that the enemy won't surround you to attack you. But what it does mean is that when the weapon forms, it will not prosper. Amen? Amen. The second text for this series is in Matthew chapter 9, verse 17. Jesus talking about fasting to his disciples. He said this, nor do they put new wine into old wineskins. Or else the wineskins break and the wine is spilled and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into into new wineskins and both are preserved. Now, without going into a long dissertation about this verse and how it's connected to fasting, and we've just finished here at the church of 21 days of fasting and prayer. What I want to encourage you, though, is as a result of spending time in fasting and prayer, You prepare yourself within yourself to be expansive. In other words, the same way you can't put new wine into an old wineskin because the old wineskin doesn't have any more elasticity. And so it can't expand any further. It will burst and the good will run out on the ground. How many have ever been there where God poured something good into your life, but because of something, it ran out on the ground? Who is quiet in this church? So what what does fasting and prayer do? It prepares you within you because that's what he said. He said, get ready because you're about to expand. Well, that's what you do. You spend time in prayer asking God, what are you saying to me about about your will and, and what you want to have happen in this way? Amen. And he'll give you clarity and understanding. Amen. Amen. So I'm I'm concluding the series that we started on this subject. And this is what God is saying to us about this season and about this time. There are four things that we looked at. The first thing that we challenged you to do was to allow your vision, God's vision for your life, to be expanded. Now, I was very clear about that. And if you need to go back, all of our messages are free, available online, YouTube, Facebook. You can get them. But what we're challenging you to do, not that your vision, God's vision for your life, not that it changes. It it can't expand in and of itself beyond itself. But your view of God's vision for your life can be expanded. It's kind of like looking at a mountain. You can see very clearly all the way to the top from the perspective where you're standing. But if you change your position, you can see more of that mountain that's been there all the days of your life. And in the same way, God's vision for your life, you, it, you can see it from a different vantage point. You could see things that you didn't know that it was God's plan for you. It was his plan all along, but you allowed your vision to be expanded. The second thing that we focused on was that we were living, we are entering into a time where miracles are going to be expanded. I believe with all my heart, we're going to get testimony after testimony. It's going to even get to the public attention. There will come a time and a season like the days of old where in church services and evangelistic meetings, people are healed of blind eyes, deaf ears. The lame will come out of wheelchairs. People who are possessed with devils and have mental illnesses, they will be healed and delivered. I'm I'm just saying what I heard him say. I believe we're living in a time where miracles in and for our lives will be expanded. Let me explain to you what a miracle is. A miracle is a supernatural intervention into the ordinary course of things. Think about that. In your life, I mean, financially, if if a large sum of money doesn't come, you're going to be in a fix as it relates to this payment. Right. As far as you can see, you don't you don't you're not in a good position to finish this thing. Well, the course of that is not going to end well. But what is a miracle is when who glory to God It's when God supernaturally intervenes on your behalf in the ordinary course of something. I believe right now while you're sitting in church, God's at home turning some things around. 
I mean, for some of us, for some of us, the course that we're on could end in divorce. For some of us, the course that we're on could end in death where symptoms of sickness and disease are concerned. The course that we're on, some of us, could end in absolute financial ruin or bankruptcy. But what I declare over your life, because of what God is saying about you, miracles are going to be expanded. There'll be more and more in the name of Jesus. The third thing we looked at, which was last week, was an expansion in receiving. You know, how, how, how awesome is it for God to confirm his word with signs following. I mean, on the, on the just days before we preach this message, the church receives, you know, in such a unique and powerful way. And then on that day, you know, somebody already had put it in their heart and prepared. And, 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 just, and I believe in that same way. It's just to confirm what God is saying. You know, you've been sowing and sowing and giving and helping people and doing for people and giving out. I believe you're living in a time where you're going to be receiving and reaping as a result of your giving and sowing. But this last one that I conclude on is probably my favorite because it's the subject of love. I want to talk to you today about experiencing love in you expanded. Are you ready for this? Love in you expanded. So my challenge to you today is to allow love to expand. One of the things that I learned is that love has the capacity to expand. Let me talk about that for a moment. It happened to me when our first son was born just three years ago. Um, our first son, I mean, he's got dimples. He's just cute. And I'm not saying that because he's my son. He really is a cute kid, right? And I'm watching this child grow up. And I'm a first-time dad. And I'm seeing what's happening on the inside of me. I love this child. Now, your child might be a little bit older than three, but how many of y'all love your child? <laughs> I'm saying like, well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, see how, we'll see how it goes as they grow up, you know. <laughs> and I begin to think, because, you know, it's in my wife and my heart to have two boys, you know. And I was thinking, prior to the baby even being conceived, how could I ever love another child as much as this? While I was meditating on that thought, my brother and his wife, uh, Kyra, they have five kids. And I begin to think, how is that even possible for them to love all of them like I love this one? And the Lord revealed something to me that I believe will revolutionize your life. He revealed to me that love has the capacity to expand. How many of you have more than one child? And how many of you love those children? Now, I know you might like one more than the other. <laughs> Depending upon. But you, I mean, be honest, you love every single one of them. Now, our second child, he's 18, 19 months old. And, oh, my gosh, he's, he's cute. Sometimes I have to watch, like, because he's now the baby, right? So I have to make sure that I, I, I love them equally. But I saw within me an expansion. So my challenge to you today is for you through this year to allow love in you to expand. It has the capacity to do it, but you have to allow it. The second thing that I want to challenge you to do is simply that, to allow the love of God to expand on the inside of you. Amen? All right, let's dig into this today. In the book of Exodus chapter 7, uh, verse 8 through 12, um, I read this during the second part, and I want to read it again because it has, you know, has a very significance. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh speaks to you, saying, Show a miracle for yourselves, then you shall say to Aaron, Take your rod and cast it before Pharaoh and let it become a serpent. 
Now, if you remember the story, this is Moses who was the deliverer of the children of Israel. And he was sent by God to Pharaoh and said, let my people, let my people go. I don't know if he did it in a, you know, a falsetto voice. But this is that moment where Moses was sent to Pharaoh and, and God said, when you get there, um, Pharaoh's going to ask you to show him a miracle. And I want you to take something that you already have. See, that rod in this story is love on the inside of you. I want you to take something that you already have, and I want you to let it become a serpent. Now, I shared at the second message that I don't like snakes. I don't even like to talk about snakes. I will close my eyes in a movie if I see a snake. I'm not scared of snakes, but I just don't like them. I don't like to talk about them. I like to think about them. And so as I was preparing the second message in this series, you know, because snakes have the capacity to expand. Come on, y'all talk to me. Is that right? You know, a snake can eat something that's much larger than the appearance of its body. It has the capacity to expand. And so he kept drawing me to this particular story for your benefit. And I want you to see in this story, something that has the capacity to span, expand. In verse 2, I mean verse 10, so Moses and Aaron went to, into Pharaoh, and they did so. Just as the Lord commanded, and Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and what happened? It became, come on, a serpent. Then the next verse, it says this in verse 11, but Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers so the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner, but they did it with their enchantments. Now, check this out. I want you to, you know, when I read the Bible and when you read your chapter, I challenge you, go there in Scripture. Imagine being in the room and watching this happen. Literally, a rod, you know, a staff, and he, he lets it go in all of a sudden, ooh, right? And it's like a miracle, but Pharaoh's like, well, that's not a big deal. We could do something supernatural. You know, God is not the only one with supernatural power. It's just his power exceeds all the power of the enemy. But the enemy can do what appears to be spectacular or supernatural things. And sure enough, Pharaoh calls in a group of men. I don't know if there were seven, eight or nine. I don't know. But they came in and each one of them with their staff, they let their staff down all of a sudden. Man, you got this room and snakes? I mean, I would be like, oh no, this is the wrong room to be in. But notice what happened, and they did it with their enchantments. So they probably like, you know, speaking like voodoo stuff. You know, that would kind of make somebody scared, but thank God when God is on your side, you don't have no reason to fear. Verse 12 says, for every man threw down his rod and they became serpents, but Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. So notice, not just one rod, not just two, but a, a number of rods became serpents. But notice this, and, I, and, I, and I, I want you to imagine it, not just notice it. While all of these snakes are on the floor, Moses' snakes grabs one of the snakes and swallows it. Then grabs another one and swallows it. I know I'm grossing you out, but it's in your Bible. <laughs> grabs another one and swallows it. Now, what I believe with all of my heart, because of this prophetic message, God is saying that no matter what weapon is formed against you, the love that God has for you, the love that you have from God in you, has the capacity, ooh, this is almost too good to preach, has the capacity to swallow up anything that the enemy does against your life. Whatever the enemy does will be swallowed up by the miracle working power of God. That's what I shared when I shared about the miracle working power of God. But today, I want to say it this way, whatever the enemy does will be swallowed up by the love of God in you. Say it out loud. Love, love. has the capacity to expand. 
Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, another scripture which I looked at, which confirms about being something being swallowed up. In verse 54, the Bible says this. So when, the, when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. If I could show you a picture of your future, it's in the latter part of this verse. Whatever comes against you to steal, kill, and destroy, at the end of the day, it will be swallowed up in victory. Verse 55 says this, Oh, death, where is your sting? And oh, hell, where is your victory? Your attitude ought to be, you know, have you ever had something, you know, have you ever said something, have, have you ever had somebody say something to you that stung? Like, ouch, that hurt. Guess what? If you listen to what I'm saying, the love that you have received from God will swallow that thing up. It'll swallow it up. It will devour it to the point where it has no ability to hurt you, harm you, ruin your life, cause you to be anything less than what God has desired or designed for you to be. You'll be able to say, oh, death, where is your state? The things that your, your, your family members used to be able to say to you that cut you quick. Come on, they, they won't be able to, they won't, it'll, it'll, it'll roll off you like dust, or like, like water off a duck's back. You'll be able to be at work and not have to be filing, you know, grievances against the supervisor. You know, she, that, you know, that was just the last time you're going to talk to me like that in front of my, I, you know, I'm going to HR. When I show you what the Lord showed me, I believe you're going to, you, I believe that you'll end up being different than the way you've been. Listen, child of God, it was never meant for you to be a bitter person. Bitterness is the result of betrayal. And I don't know about you, in my life, I've been betrayed. And if we let it, if we allow it, that betrayal can cause a baby to be born on the inside of, his, of us called bitterness. And bitterness, if you leave it, will keep you from expansion. Because the new thing that God is pouring in your life can't be contained by that old wine skin, that old way, come on, that old skin that was touchy, fretful, and resentful. Verse 56 says, the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So I believe with all my heart, God has given you the victory, but the way that you'll experience it is by loving you, swallowing up anything that comes and anything that comes up. Amen? Now, so as it goes with me, when I hear from the Lord, and I do hear from God, I hope that doesn't scare you. You know, Jesus said, my sheep, Know my voice. Now, I don't hear him on the outside with these paddles. I mean, these things called ears. <laughs> now, I, I, I've come to terms with the size of my ears, and I'm okay with that. <laughs> now, if it bothers you, don't let it bother you. I'm okay with that. Now, when I hear from God, I don't hear him audibly. I mean, if he chose to speak to me in that way, I'd be okay with it because I love him, right? I know that he exists. I believe that he exists. And it would be okay for him to talk to me. But most of the time, when I hear God, I hear him on the inside. You want to know another thing? It often sounds like my thoughts. The only problem is, I'm not that smart. <laughs> I know I'm college educated, and I've got some experience in working in other relations. Amen. But I know I'm not that smart. So when I heard from God about this particular message, he gave me a passage of scripture that describes love's capacity to expand, and his will for you to allow love in you to expand. Go with me, if you would, to the book of Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 38, this is an amazing passage. 
In Matthew 5.38, he said this, you have heard that it was said an eye for an eye and a two for two. Anybody ever heard that expression? Well, then Jesus was telling the truth. But, you know, I want to take it one step beyond a tooth for a tooth. I know you might be here. All of us have family. And some of us have marriage relationships. And I don't know if you've ever been there in a tit for tat. You know, okay, you know, I've asked you to not put the paper towel, on, you know, the toilet paper on the roll this way. I mean, you know, the, the proper way to put the toilet paper on the roll is where it flaps over because, well, you, you shouldn't be digging for anything. <laughs> it just needs to... Now, no, no, y'all don't mess with me. I got, I got proof. Now, it may not matter. You might just take it out and put it on whichever way it fall and then just deal with it. But if you go to a, a five-star, even a four, you can go to a three-star hotel and all of them, they even fold the little in with triangle. Come on, somebody. Y'all gonna help me in this shirt. Oh, okay, so you're going to keep complaining about the toilet tissue, then I'm going to cook your toast a little extra hard. Come on. <laughs> You'd be amazed in marriage relationships how petty little things can become. It becomes tit for tat. I want you to take that kind of reality and bring it into this past passage of scripture and really hear what the Lord is saying. An eye for an eye, if somebody do this, then you do that. On the job, okay, they're going to do this. All right, well, I'm going to get even. Okay, they're going to do that. Okay, well, I'm going to do this. Okay, you're going to do that. And then, oh, you're going to cut me off in traffic? Whoa, 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 whoa. Road rage? And you say it. You have heard it said that if they cut you off in traffic, you go around and cut them off. Y'all, y'all, are y'all with me now? So the next verse, Jesus is talking. He says, but I tell you, resist an evil person. Whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn to him also the other. Come on up here, brother. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. This is my man, Brother Stephen. He's, he's one of our finest and best. I'm not going to do him like that. But, but can we read the Bible? Because most of us are not at this level yet. If you look at us in our relationships, on the job, or in the home, we're not doing what Jesus said. I mean, he says, I'm telling you, you've got something on the inside of you that can get past that nasty person. He says, if somebody slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. Now, again, today, you may not have that capacity. I mean, some of you from where you come up and how you've come through, I mean, by the time they, <laughs> you, you was halfway into it. <laughs> you know, it was just like a reaction, like, oh, man. Man, the pastor just talked to us about, I'm so sorry, right? One of my teachers in the faith, in the faith taught, taught us that it ought to be that you develop in your love walk to the point where if somebody slapped you, your first thought, because love believes the best of every person. If somebody slaps you, you ought to think, did you trip? I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Did you trip? (laughs) Excuse me. All right, let's keep going. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your what? Cloak also. One translation says if they want to take your jacket or if they want to take your, 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 your jacket, Give them your shirt also. You know, they're coming against you and make this big a fuss. I don't know if, if, if we're there the way that we really need to be or what, the way that we really should be, but I want to challenge you to this year allow love to expand. What am I saying? He said, whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him what? 
What am I challenging you today? I'm challenging you to go the extra mile. Look for, a, I got one right and a couple nods. Come on. I'm challenging you to look for opportunities for you to go the extra mile rather than mile for mile. I mean, somebody's pleading with, oh, man, can you help me out? I mean, can you do this? And you, you've been going, going the distance. He says if, if somebody compels you to do something for them, go the extra mile. Uh, better keep going. Let's keep reading. See if you got something else. He said, give to him that asked you and from him who wants to borrow from you. Do not turn away. Verse 43. You have heard that it was said that you shall love your neighbor and do what? Hate your enemy. I mean, I've heard it because it's in the Bible. But in life. Is this a part of like love those that love you and. Hate those that hate you. I mean, to me, that's how they teach you in the streets. That's how they teach you in the world. That you love people that look out for you, and you need to look out for the ones that don't look out for you. But notice what Jesus says. You heard that it was said to love. Now, this, listen, the word neighbor, uh, I heard Creflo Dollar say this one time. Uh, the word neighbor is kind of compound word nay, which is near, and bore, which means by or someone that's close to you. Every time, I hope you do this, especially if you're married or if you ever want to be married, in the word of God, when you see, like, love your neighbor and do this for your neighbor and who is your neighbor, you know, the Samaritan, so forth and so on, think of people that are near you. Yeah, David, Danny, and Daryl live on three sides of where my wife and I live, but I hardly know them. But how many of y'all know my wife is far more a neighbor to me than Daryl, Danny, and, and, and David? Am I right? She's the closest thing. To, I mean, we sleep in the same bed. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, God. That was a good thought. So, so expand what he's saying here. He's talking about to the people that are closest to you in life. He's telling you love them irrespective of how they have been towards you. He says, I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those that hate you. And pray for those that spitefully use you and persecute you. How many of y'all see that in this passage... He's talking about allowing love in you to expand, to go beyond the what people do and how people love in the world. He's saying, go the extra mile. In the next verse, in verse 45, he says, do this that you may be sons of your father in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? I mean, think about it. If I love somebody that's doing me right, I mean, you know, big deal. But when I love somebody that's doing me wrong, that's going the extra mile. He says, if you greet your brother and your family members only, and let me say this, my prayer, our prayer as a church family, is that nobody ever comes to Faith Family Church and leaves without somebody making them feel welcome and at home. I got one amen and one amen in the back. And so what am I saying? Be sure to speak to somebody. Amen. Just make sure that you're one of many people that said hi while they were here. Amen. I mean, because if you just greet people that you know only, then what more do, the, the, do, do others? Don't even the tax collectors do that? In verse 48, he says, therefore, as a result of all of these 11 verses, you shall be perfect just as your father in heaven is perfect. Now, the word perfect here doesn't mean flawless like a diamond. It means fully grown, fully developed. It means mature. We were in a series about perfecting love. And essentially, this is a passage of scripture that's about you allowing love's capacity to swallow up all those evil, hateful, and hurtful things that have been done to you. Listen to me with all your heart. You, st you should not still be tripping over something that happened to you in your youth. Verse 
If your dad wasn't there for you or if, if your loved one let you down or if something really, really bad happened to you, it shouldn't be tormenting your life today. What I want to challenge you to do is to allow love to swallow that, that, very hurt, that thing that stung. Let love swallow that thing up. You say, well, how do I do that? Well, just like he did in Matthew uh, that we were just at, he did the same thing in Luke 6. The answer is you're going to have to forgive. Let me show you. In Mark chapter 11, verse 24, he said, For therefore I say unto you, this is Jesus, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. We just did that. But in verse 25, he says one more thing. He says, and whenever you stand praying, if you have, not if somebody else has, if you have anything against anyone, do what? Forgive him that your father in heaven may also forgive you your what? Trespasses. So that thing stung. It hurt deep. It has really shaped a part of who you are. But how do you get past it? How do you get the stinger out, Pastor Stan? That's love's job. Love will swallow that thing up. And you'll be able to say, oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? So check this out. Love, I'm, I'm sorry, forgiveness is the expansion of love. Woo, man, I'm preaching good, golly. Really, it's not me. This is what I heard from God. He said this, forgiveness. When you think about it, what is it? It's love swallowing something that somebody did when they did you wrong. Forgiveness is the expansion of love. In Matthew chapter 18, as I get ready to close, in verse 21, Peter came to him and said, Lord, yeah, you better play something soft, man. It's getting kind of thick and deep. And, hey, man. He said, and Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. And he thought he was asking a big number. I want you to really absorb what this question is because maybe, maybe you're here. And again, a brother is a relative. But you could be in a church, and we're brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. I mean, guys in the military, they consider themselves brothers at arms. We're talking about somebody really, really close to you, let alone we know what he said about the stranger or the enemy. But let's focus for those that are, you know, because the folks closest to you really are the ones that could say something or do something that hurts you the most. Is that right? So he had a relevant question. Jesus had been teaching him, teaching them about going the extra mile and all these wonderful things. And it just came to him. It looks like, you know, I'm struggling with this. Because there have been some people that have really, really hurt me. And have really done me wrong. I know me personally, I, I, I've had that happen. And he asked Jesus, he said, Lord, how often should somebody close to me be able to do something that hurts me? And I'd be able to forgive him. Seven times? It seems like a lot. Look at the answer. Jesus said to him, I don't say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. That's 490 times. One implication was as if it was 490 times in the same day. Now that's got to be a marriage. <laughs> I mean, think about it. You know, you ask her not to push all the covers on your side of the bed just because she don't like to feel trapped and on her side of the bed need to be able to get. Am I telling too much business? Amen. I'm waking up with dreams like, get me out of here. Get me out of here. So in the middle of the night, they're doing something. And then, you know, all of that. And then you first thing in the morning. Uh -huh, and, then, and then throughout the day. And, and then all in the afternoon. And then you get home. And, oh, now you going there with that. And, come on, somebody. And by, and by the time you get, I mean, he's talking about like 400. Now obviously, he's not doing it in a quantifiable sense. What is he saying? 
He's saying it doesn't matter. If somebody does something that, that stings, let the love of God in you swallow that thing in victory. I don't have time to tell the story that Jesus begins to tell. He says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. He tells about two servants, one owed like a whole lot. And the guy begged him, please, please forgive me. The guy said, all right, I know you've, you've, you owe me a lot, but I forgive you. Let the guy go. That guy go down the street, find somebody that owed him like $50. He grabbed that guy by the throat. Pay me what you owe me. God didn't have it, threw his family in jail over $50 or whatever it was. And the Lord, the master, heard about that situation. And he said, take that guy and get rid of him. He was forgiven a whole bunch. But then somebody who did him wrong just a little, in comparison, wouldn't even forgive him. And he says that that's us. How many times in a day... Do we do something, say something, look at something, or go somewhere? That's a sin against God. Ooh, I ain't getting no amens on that. But doesn't he forgive us for all of our trespasses? So for us to hold something against somebody else when God has been so forgiving for us is to not appreciate the forgiveness that we receive for him. Amen? Amen. Over, over my life, there are two things that are the most beautiful expression of love that I've ever seen in my life. I struggled to share this part of the message. It was almost too deep. I mean, this is our grand opening. There's a lot of people here that may be visiting, visiting for the first time for sure. But I'm under a mandate to minister what God gives me. I'm challenging you to allow God's love in you to expand and swallow up anything that's come against you. Two beautiful expressions. I've been in ministry. I graduated Bible school in 1996. You do the math. I was hired into full-time ministry. I've been in churches from Florida to Arizona, from Toronto to Houston and far north to south. I've literally counseled marriages in, in all of those locations from north to south. I've counseled people. I've watched people's lives. But when I see these two things, it's almost overwhelming to me. And it's the perfect illustration of love's capacity to swallow up anything the devil has. The first is when someone loves a child that they are not a biological parent of. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, I ain't getting no amen, so I need to take a minute on that. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5, it says, Having predestined us to the adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Everybody say adoption. I want you to think about this. When you love those that have been good to you, I mean, even the publicans do, you know, I mean, it's not a big deal for you to love your own kids. They're your kids. You're not doing anybody a favor loving your child. One woman comes to heart. Um, she has fostered and adopted children. Sister Tammy Robinson is a member of Faith Family Church and has been for many, many years. She doesn't have any biological children of her own, but she's raised so many of her relatives and other children. And I've watched her love Man, it's quiet. Love those kids as though they were their own. The reason why I say that is in counseling so many marriages and families, you know, we have an, a, a phenomenon that is normal today called a blended family. Because of departure from the Word of God, you know, people have sex out of wedlock and they end up having children out of those sexual relationships and there's no covenant and so one person goes one way, the other person goes away. But now you've got a biological child here, and then later on you get married. And maybe that other person has a biological child. And now in your mind, you got your kid, and he's got his kid, and then we got a kid together. Am I preaching good? 
I am challenging you in this year to allow love in you to expand where in you you see no difference between the one born biologically and the one that's born the second most beautiful expression of love is as it relates to a spouse who loves beyond adultery I really wrestled to share and to, to minister this message. It's not a big deal for me to love my wife. We just, I feel like we're still newlyweds. We'll be celebrating five years married. Come on. It's March. Actually, in two months, it'll be five years married. Like I said, I've been counseling for decades. And to me, it just, it, it, it's the most powerful thing I have ever seen. When a man or a woman decides to allow the love of God to swallow up such a hurt. Now, I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, it, it, it's a serious thing. I mean, the Bible talks about it in, in, uh, in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4. The Bible says that marriage is honorable among all and the bed is undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. I mean, it is a serious thing. It has been and it always will be. But how many of y'all know God forgives us of all of our iniquities? And we have the, I ain't getting no yeses and amens on that. I'm just a messenger, but this, this will help you. Maybe, maybe what's happened in your life isn't this deep. But then that means you should have no excuse to be able to swallow up some of the things that you've had to endure. Ah, oh, still quiet. Let me keep going. Now, obviously, if a person is continuing in their sin, it really brings the question if they're even saved. I mean, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8 that the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the sexually immoral, which includes the adulterer, the sorcerer, the idolater, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, and this is the second death. If a person continues, you know, God doesn't expect you to be a, a dumping mat and a garbage pen for somebody's foolishness and ill treatment. Can I get a better amen than that? But in the next verse, in John chapter 8, in verse 11, there was a woman that came to Jesus. She was in the very act. I got one, come on. And he's an unmarried man at the present time. I appreciate all the amens you can give me right now, brother, because this is hard plowing right now. Y'all know the story. I'm describing to you something that's just phenomenal to me. Love has that capacity. And some, it's not a, a victory story that we can, you know, just wave as a flag, you know, to bring no shame upon anyone. So we have to inwardly celebrate what God has done in your life to be able to do what it is. But I celebrate you. I celebrate the love of God in you. It's the most beautiful thing that I've seen. It's a great expression of love for that person to say, though you've hurt me significantly, God's love in me swallows up. Come here, let me love you like God loves you. How does God love you? He'll forgive you of the worst of the worst. Am I right? He asked the woman, he says, where are your accusers? Do nobody accuse you? And she said, no one, Lord. Listen to what Jesus says. He said, neither do I condemn you, but do what? Go and sin no more. Amen. Allow love to rise up so big on the inside of you that it alters your life for the rest of your life. I challenge you, allow love to expand in your life. You get anything out of the word of God today? Will you bow your head with me before we dismiss? Heavenly Father, I pray for every person under the sound of my voice. If there's anybody here 
who's been hurt so deeply that it's seemingly been unbearable in life. If that's you, I want to pray with you. Father, we pray for them that you will express your love to them, that it will swallow up the sting of death, the experience of heartache and heartbreak, that they will find it within themselves to forgive even in the darkest moments. In Jesus' name. So while every head is bowed, and this is a very private moment, if you're here today and you've been hurt in a very deep way, my eyes are closed and I'm asking you to close your eyes. I want this to be between you and God. And if there's still a bit of sting that remains, whether it's something recent, whether it's something in your adulthood or even in your childhood, I want to challenge you to forgive so if you're here today and you have something against someone and you're ready to let it go today, fresh off of a message from God, while nobody's looking around, I want you to just raise your hand, put it up before God, and then put your hand down, just enough for him to see it and for you to acknowledge it. And I want to pray for you. I want to lead you in a word of prayer to release that person and to forgive them that trespass. So everybody, so, know there, so there's no embarrassment, I want you to pray this out loud. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I believe you brought me to hear this message and I receive it. And I make a heart decision, although my head struggles or that it may struggle, I decide in my heart to forgive that person for how they wronged me and I choose to forgive like you forgive and that means to forget about it and if I'm ever reminded I will forget again and if I'm reminded again I will remember that I have forgiven them and I will choose to forget it again so in the name of Jesus I let that thing go. I express your love in my heart towards that person. I pray for them right now that you will send laborers across their path to minister to them and to touch them, to be a blessing to them in Jesus' name. And now I'm asking that you will expand my life that you will cause to manifest something good as a result of me obeying your word. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Put your hands together. <laughs> Glory to God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Glory to God. Now, we also don't want to dismiss without giving you the opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of your life. So if you are here,